So here's our original problem again. We have the ages of uh, the samples that we've taken in three different states, the age that they get married, and so we're trying to do a test at the 0.1 level of significance, which is 90% level of confidence, do an ANOVA test to see if the average age of marriage in these three states are equal or not. So we're going to use everything that we've done up to this point and teach you how to create the test statistic and the, the, uh, the rejection region in order to figure out if this is a rejection or, or not of the null hypothesis. So let's write a few things down. First thing is we're going to recall that the null hypothesis right, is uh, that the population mean of uh, population number one is the same as population two is the same as the population three. So these would be the age of marriage for all women in New York, all women in Texas, all women in Oregon. We're saying that the means of these guys are the same. That's the null hypothesis. And the alternate hypothesis, uh, you just usually write it out in words, at least... Uh, one mean different from the others. So I'm going to write it as at least one mean different. So we don't know which one, or it could be more than one that are significantly different. And also, don't forget, you can have uh, you know 15, 20, 30 populations if your if your test does, if your test set is lend, lends itself to that. We're just doing three of them to teach you how to do it. So notice here that we have a 0.1 level of significance, so we'll need to use the correct table for that. And before we actually get into the table, we need to write down what the rejection region looks like for an ANOVA test. Now the good news is it's pretty easy. For the rejection test, for the rejection region, okay, ANOVA, at least the kinds of problems we're doing right now, is always a right tail test, right? tail test. For right now, I just want you to accept that it is always a right tail test, that it makes your life easy. You don't have to go back up to the null hypothesis or to the alternate and try to decide if it's left tail, right tail, or two tail. For ANOVA, it's always right tail. And I'm going to talk a little bit later, maybe in the next lesson, why uh, it's right tail. But for now, just realize that it's always right tail, All right, which actually makes your life easier because now I can draw a little picture and just show you what those what these rejection regions are going to look like. So we have, uh, for instance, our F distribution. It's going to go up something like this, right? This is F, and there's going to be some critical value that's going to go up to here, and I'm going to shade it in a different region where everything to the right of this value has area alpha. That's what a right-hand test is. And so this critical value is F sub alpha. So that's the critical value we need. This is the hurdle that you have to jump over. If we get on the other side of it, then we'll be rejecting the null hypothesis. So the way we'll denote that is we'll say up until F alpha, if you get anything to the right of that, you reject the null hypothesis. And anything in this region, uh, I'm just going to do it like this. Do it like this. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so it's the same sort of thing we set up for all of these tests. All we have to do now for this problem is figure out what F alpha is. That's our hurdle. And then we have to calculate where our data calculates F to be. And if it's over here, then we fail to reject. And if it's over here, we reject the null hypothesis. So let's go down here and take it uh, one step at a time. All right, let's go to the next. Yeah, I think we'll do a little bit better if we go to the next slide. So let's go over here. Here I actually have the F table, uh, and we'll actually use that in just a second, uh, so don't, don't quite worry about that just yet. First, let's talk about the test statistic. Test statistic. Okay, and that is F. What is F? It's very simple. It's the MST, the mean of the sum of squares of treatments, divided by MSE, the mean uh, of, the, of the sum of squares of errors. So you see, that's why I broke this problem into so many different sections, because one section we learn how to calculate this number, one section we learn how to calculate this number. So if you don't remember what that is, go back, you have to start at the beginning with me and go through all of these sections. I don't, I don't have enough hours you know, or enough uh, time to go back through all of what the meaning of all of these are again, but basically we went through this in excruciating detail. Same thing with this. But the top here is basically a measure of 
how different any of the sample means are compared to the grand mean, and the bottom one is a measure of the spread of the individual data sets inside the populations, essentially what it is. Now don't forget that MST itself is calculated, MST is calculated by the sum of squares of treatments over, we had to divide by, the number of populations minus one. And this MSE, don't forget, was, this is going to be important in a second, it was the sum of squares of errors, which is the spread of the data inside the population, divided by the total number of samples uh, with a correction factor n minus k. So basically, this is the sum of squares of errors divided by, kind of like divided by the total number of samples. You have a correction factor, but that's why it makes it an average. This is the sum of squares among treatments divided by the total number of treatments, again, with a small correction factor. The reason I'm writing this down for you here is because you see, the numerator is basically this, which is equal to this. So the reason it's important is because the degree of freedom, which you'll need in a second, of the numerator is going to be this number, k minus 1, the number of populations minus 1, because that's what lives on the numerator. The degree of freedom of the denominator, what do you think that's going to be? The degree of freedom that we're going to use is going to be n minus k. Now that I've told you all that, that, that really gives us everything we need to solve the problem because now we can calculate the test statistic and we know how to, how to use the degrees of freedom from the numerator and denominator so we can use the table to find out what F alpha, alpha, alpha is. Now this was all kind of theory up here, just reminding you of this stuff. Now let's go ahead and solve our problem. For our problem, F, the test statistic, is the mean square among treatments divided by the mean square among errors or of errors. For our problem, MST we calculated was 12.033334, right? And the um, uh, mean square of errors we calculated to be 4.2. So our test statistic, 12.0333 and so on, divided by 4.2 is 2.865079. Carrying a lot of decimals here. This is the test statistic. This is what our data says our test statistic is. All right, test statistic. So this is really important. So I'll put like a little asterisk here, right? Now let's go off and calculate something else underneath it. That's just one of the two numbers we need. Now we need to know where the hurdle is. Where is F alpha? Because we need to know if this test statistic falls to the left or to the right of F alpha. So to find F alpha, um, the degree of freedom of the numerator of this test statistic up here, the numerator here, is k minus 1. That's the uh, number of populations, which is 3 minus 1. So the degree of free of the numerator, the degree of freedom of the numerator is 2. The degree of freedom of the denominator uh, is n minus k. n is the total number of samples among everything that we sampled. We had 10 from Texas, 10 from New York, 10 from Oregon, so that would be 30 altogether. So little n there. Is all it's 30 minus k. k is the number of populations, so it's 3. So this means the degree of freedom of the denominator is 27. Okay? So because our problem is alpha of 0.1, and because this table gives us the, the uh, value of f alpha that gives us this area to the right, which is exactly what we want, okay? Remember, let's just go back up to this real quick. Basically, F alpha is the value of F that gives us an area of alpha to the right. And our problem is alpha is 0.1. So we use a table that gives us values where alpha, where the area is always 0.1 to the right. Now we just have to look uh, uh, across the top and the bottom. So we have a degree of freedom of the numerator of 2 and a degree of freedom of the denominator of 27. So we go down here and we run off the page. So here we're in, don't forget, column number 2. So then we'll just go down here till we can finally see 27. And in column number 2, 27 is right here. 27 is right here, 2.51. So F alpha is 2.51. Now, when I did this problem the first time, I had a, a, a table with more digits. So I'll write it as 2.5106. Okay? And that's really important. All right, so now we have enough information. Let's just go ahead and shift this up just a little bit and draw our final conclusion from this whole problem. So what we have is an F distribution, 
right? And what we figured out is that F sub alpha is 2.5106, right? And that is a shaded region to the right of alpha. But our test statistic from our data is actually 2.86, so that falls clearly to the right somewhere over here. I'll write it like this. F is 2.865079. So because it falls to the right, and we already drew the rejection regions before, we are clearly in the rejection region over here, so we reject the null hypothesis. And that's basically the answer. At this level of significance, we reject the null hypothesis. Now, what was the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis was basically, let's go back up way up to the top here, the null hypothesis was that all three of these populations from New York, Texas, and Oregon, that the average age of females that get married from all the females in New York, Texas, and Oregon, the null hypothesis was that they were all equal. So we want to test this, but we have to create a threshold for, for how confident we are in our answer. And our threshold was 90% level of confidence. So we want to test at 90% level of confidence, which is 0.1 level of significance, if this is actually true. So we sample 10 uh, women from each of those states and we get the average value of their age and we just want to see if within within that level of significance or level of confidence if the if that implies that the population means for these states from these women getting married are all the same or not. So we go into a bunch of calculations in previous sections ultimately leading to one thing and one thing only. We just need to calculate this test statistic. We need these two numbers to do it. So we get those two numbers, which we've calculated previously, and our test statistic falls clearly to the right of our hurdle that we need to jump over. Because our hurdle is basically telling us that if this number exists to, uh, to the right of F alpha, if our test statistic is to the right of F alpha, then the evidence is strong enough that they're different, that the null hypothesis is rejected. So you write down that you reject the null hypothesis and the evidence supports that in those three states the average age of women getting married is not the same. And it doesn't tell you, by the way, which state is different. It doesn't tell you that Oregon was different than the other two, or maybe there was two states that were different. It doesn't tell you anything about which state was different. It only tells you that they're not the same. And if you're going to go into details of which one's different, then you have additional analysis beyond the scope of an ANOVA test. The ANOVA test only tells you if you're rejecting that null hypothesis or not, and it does not tell you which one is different. You could have a po uh, you know comparing 30 populations, um, and, and and maybe your your null hypothesis is that all 30 of them have the same average value. And if you reject that null hypothesis, it doesn't tell you which of the 30 are different. You have to go and, and look more, deep, more deeply at the data. And it's not so easy to figure out. If it were that easy, you would just look at the raw data and decide. But that's basically what it is. That's how you construct the ANOVA test. All of the work goes into finding these values, which we've done by hand, as, as you've seen in the last couple of sections, by hand, it's pretty tedious just because there's a lot of numbers and so on and so forth. So, this is how you, how you do it. We've, we've figured this out. I have a couple of things I want to teach you in the next section to wrap it up, and then we're going to go and use the computer to solve this problem and also other problems so that you can see how, how easy it is and how to interpret the results from a computer. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.